Hi friends, it's Tilly, and welcome to the making of my Evil Queen cosplay. I'm extremely excited because she's by far the most complex costume I've ever made, as well as the one I am most proud of. I think she is definitely the best costume I've made in my costuming journey. I'm excited to share with you the full compilation that includes the petticoat and underlayer all the way through to the finishing details. If you enjoyed this video, don't forget to like and subscribe. My goal is to reach a thousand subscribers and it would be incredible to have you along. So let's get started. Part one of this adventure is going to be the A-line petticoat. Let's first talk about the design. It's hard to see in about 100% of these photos because the bar is conveniently placed at her waist, but it is in fact smooth, much like her other costumes throughout the park. Her skirt looks fairly basic, but I wanted to make it nice and full, so I decided to make it into a circle skirt. The dress itself is smooth at the waist, so I didn't include any gathering there. The silhouette is A-line, so the plan is to add two tiers of gathering at the bottom for flare and volume. And that's it. Next, we'll talk materials. I like cotton petticoats a lot compared to other materials such as tulle or taffeta. It's easier to work with and not very scratchy. Let's be real, is scratchy something you really want for 12 plus hours at a con? I don't think so. I chose a black cotton broadcloth that is 60 inches wide for my fabric. I first washed and ironed it to prep. Other materials needed were grain for the waistband, hooks and bars, interfacing, all-purpose thread, and top stitch heavy duty thread. I'll put a list of recommended non-sponsored products in the description below. Next, we'll go over the pattern. For the circle skirt base pattern, I used Mood Circle Skirts Calculator and created a quarter piece pattern based on the measurements from the calculator and my length measurement. Once I had the pattern, I cut the two back pieces and the front piece on the fold. Next, we'll go over the construction. First, I overlocked the raw edges on the skirt panels. I stitched together the side seams and the back seam. When stitching the back seam, only stitch to where the placket will be. Putting on the placket was a struggle. I definitely haven't done that in about seven years, but the general idea of what I did here was a continuous placket. Plackets are used when an opening to a garment has a tight fit, such as a skirt at the waistline or at a sleeve cuff. They provide structure and strength to the opening while putting on or taking off the garment. Continuous plackets can be made on a seam or a slash, and it's made in one long rectangular piece. For additional strength, I cut out a second rectangle in interfacing and ironed together. It's first stitched on one side. The raw edges are folded in and stitched on the other side via top stitching, or you can stitch in the ditch for a cleaner look. Last, you can do a top stitch on the overlapped side. It can be challenging to make sure it's clean and that the apex of the placket doesn't have any additional tucks. Take it slowly and you'll get it. Let's go over it one more time as I demonstrate on my own petticoat. I measured out 2x the length of the placket I cut it out on the bias and then ironed on the interfacing. Next, I trimmed away the seam allowance in the skirt where the placket would go to a quarter inch. I sewed the wrong side of the fabric to the right side of the placket. I then ironed the seam allowance towards the inside of the placket, and I ironed the quarter inch seam allowance in as well on the other side. From there, fold the placket in half and your raw edge will be hidden iron and stitch into place. And then top stitch the overlapped side of the placket to hold it in place. Definitely not perfect, but the placket was done, so I moved on to the waistband. For the waistband, I'll first demonstrate on some scraps. I've marked the wrong side of the fabric and my internal grow grain ribbon with an X. Stitch the wrong side ribbon down at the waist first. Flipping it to the right side, I'll put on the second grow grain ribbon by stitching it at the top. Last, stitch the right side grow grain down at the waist. From there, 
tuck in the raw edges of the grow grain on each side and stitch down. Once more, I'll show you on my own petticoat as well. I cut out my waist measurement plus four inches for the overlap. Stitching on the wrong side ribbon first at the waist. Then stitch the right side ribbon on to the top of the wrong side ribbon and then to the skirt itself. This will help make sure the stitching on the outside is neat. I then folded in the raw edges of the grow grain and stitched them down as well. From there, I hand sewed the hooks and bars on as the closures. I finished off the circle skirt with a quarter inch hem at the bottom. Next, we'll go over the tiers. In order to clarify what I mean by segments, let's go over the petticoat math. I'm going to keep things simple and use even numbers here since everyone's math is going to be a little bit different. Here I'm using 150 inches as the circumference of the circle skirt where the top tier will be placed and 250 inches for the second tier placement. From there, I know I want 2x the length of that amount in order to have a full amount of gathers. You could optionally also use a 1.5x multiplier instead if you want a little bit less fullness. Starting with the top tier, I'll take that 150 inches in circumference and multiply it by 2 to get 300 inches total. I'll then divide that 300 by my fabric width, which is 60 inches, to get five segments that I will need in my petticoat tier. For the second tier, I'm going to do the same math and do 250 multiplied by 2 to get 500 inches total. I'll take the 500 inches and divide it by 60, which is my fabric width, to get 8.3. Here, I decided to round up to 9, which I did for both of my tiers, in order to make sure I have proper fullness, as well as overcompensate for any seam allowance that I did not include in the 60 inch width math. I personally wanted really large tiers, so I made them 12 inches wide with seam allowance. I measured 11 inches up from the hem at the bottom tier and nine inches above that for the top tier with some overlap. At 2x the bottom tier, I needed eight segments and the top had six. So I cut out all of the strips and was ready to put it together. After overlocking the top of the tier, I then hemmed the bottom. After the struggle to hem the circle skirt, I consulted a friend and she recommended stay stitching first, which I completely forgot about. <laughs> this is why I'm doing this. This is why documentation is a good thing. To stay stitch, I did a row of stitching at a stitch length of four, a quarter inch from the raw edge. Then I folded the raw edge in and ironed along the stay stitching line. Next, I turned up the ironing and ironed again to hold it in place. Then I returned to a two and a half stitch length and stitched it in place. And she was right, it was so much easier. I then used the top stitch heavy duty thread in my bobbin and regular thread at the top of my machine and stitched in two rows of gathering lines at the longest stitch-like setting. This helped make sure my lines were steady so that they wouldn't break. The first I put right at the edge of the overlock and the second I did a quarter inch below that. Doing this in sections helped me make sure that the gathers were even. And as a pro tip, I like to do my gathering in sections rather than all the way around in case the line breaks. That way, if it does happen, you won't have to do it all over again. To attach the bottom tier, I segmented the skirt bottom tier circumference into eight. Together, hold the two bottom heavy duty threads in one hand and gently slide the fabric along the lines. Careful not to sew your gathering lines too close together or the fabric won't be able to slide through. Other things to watch out for include pulling too hard and breaking a line or losing a thread out the other side of your gathering line. I also like to use parallel pinning in order to make sure I'm evenly dispersing the gathers and I can stitch over top of them. 
and top stitch that tier down at the second gathering line. And the first tier is finished. I then did the same steps for the second tier and finished. I now have a very full and swooshy petticoat. I'm very excited for this project. Honestly, for my first petticoat, I'm over the moon with how this turned out. I was really intimidated to make it due to all of the ruffles, but it was super fun and actually pretty straightforward. For part two of the Evil Queen, which includes the undershirt, gloves, and hood. I'll get into why the hood was such a challenge to the point where I made 12 mock-ups, but first, let's go over the shirt and the gloves. For the base of my underlayer, I wanted to protect the main dress as much as possible. I know the costume is going to be quite warm, and sweating through a costume is a big fear of mine thanks to Florida and Mickey's not-so-scary Halloween party. Just so much sweating. To help combat that sweating and reduce the amount of washing and wear on the dress, I'm using a new me as a base. Now I'm not sponsored nor have I battle tested this shirt at a con or Disney World, so we'll let you know how this goes. The idea is that it has a more protective layer under the armpit. I will still probably end up using panty liners in the armpits as well to help, but I knew off the bat that making the entire top out of velvet would be way too hot. With the base shirt purchased, I moved on to the gloves. The design of the gloves is similar to a close fitting sleeve, but includes the hand point starting at the wrist with a middle finger loop. The curve of the hand can be a bit of a challenge, so I decided to use an actual glove as a pattern. For the gloves tutorial, you will need a glove to pattern off of or a pattern, your fashion fabric, I'm using a stretch velvet, elastic for the finger loops, I'm using a ballet elastic, and that's it. To start, I ordered a pair of gloves that matched the shape I wanted in the cheapest color possible. When they arrived, I took apart the side seam. traced it onto some craft paper, and trued up some of the lines and corners. From there, I cut out from my fashion fabric, first we'll overlock all edges of the sleeve to make sure that there are no raw edges. Next, we'll put right sides together and stitch the side seam. For the sleeve hem, we'll do a turned hem where we'll take that overlocked edge, turn it in a quarter of an inch, and top stitch down. Stitched on the elastic loops by following the same sewing line as the hem and finish the gloves by zigzagging them onto the base shirt. With the gloves complete, I moved to the more intimidating part of my last few weeks. The hood is designed to be very form-fitting and include a peak or point at the forehead. With that design in mind, I started working on the pattern. I started by draping and then doing many mock-ups and fittings. After some confusion and SOS calls to my best friend in London, we landed on this pattern. It includes two seams at the top of the head to be form-fitting and a seam at the neck. This is what the pattern looks like completely laid flat. With the two sides of the head, the middle section that includes where the zipper will go, and the cowl. With the pattern complete, I started to put it together. For the hood tutorial, you will need a pattern or draping material with a wig head, your fashion fabric, interfacing, lining fabric, I used a cotton broadcloth left over from my petticoat, pinking shears, and a zipper. First, I cut out my pieces with a half inch seam allowance and ironed on the interfacing to strengthen the point and the top of the head. I also cut out three facing pieces that will help the point keep its shape. 
Before you start interfacing, I would do a test piece first. Remember to use a protective layer or ironing cloth and follow the fabric's instructions for ironing so you don't accidentally ruin your fabric. Next, I stay stitched for just at the peak of the hood. From there, you can stitch together the top head strip to the sides of the head. I'm going to also show you what this looks like on a mock-up because it's a little easier to see. So you'll see I have one side of the head here with the face opening on this side. It is attached at the neck, so it's cut on the fold with no seam, to the other side of the face. The middle head strip is also cut on the fold, and you can see here where the peak is and where it attaches to the side of the head. So the first step will be to attach that center strip to each side of the head. You can also see where the back zipper will be placed. Next, we'll go over an example that I think is a little easier to see than just on the black velvet alone. I'll first be demonstrating how to bag out the facing. So what I'm going to do is start with a cotton and a lycra, which are going to be relatively similar to the stretches of my own lining and the velvet fabric. Start by placing the right sides together and pin along your sewing lines. Next, you can start to follow the lines and stitch it down in place. When you get to the peak of the head, it can be often hard to stitch in corners and it's pretty easy for the sewing machine to pass a corner. So what I recommend is to actually use the hand crank to walk the needle to the point and then you can keep the needle down to easily pivot and keep going. From there, you can use the pinking shears to pink the seam allowance to make sure it doesn't fray. This is also a great option for when you don't want to have a lot of bulk. Next, this is going to be really important for the curves. You can clip into your seam allowance to help with the curve structure and to make sure the seam allowance doesn't get in your way when you're trying to bag it out. Just remember to be careful not to clip into your stitching. You can also clip the peak horizontally to make sure that there are no additional seam allowances right at that point to make sure it is sharp as possible. From there, you can turn them right sides out and go ahead and press to make sure it's lying flat before top stitching down. And there you have a very neat and nice point. Now I'll do the same thing with my hood by pinking around the face clipping, and then inserting the facing by bagging it out. I used a straight stitch where the lining is and a zigzag around the bottom of the face. From there, I attach the cowl and the zipper. And there you have it. It's not perfect, but it's done. Part three of the Evil Queen cosplay, the dress. We'll start by going over the design. Her main dress from the Tokyo Disney Sea show Villain's World is similar to the movies with a tight-fitting bodice, large sleeves, and A-line skirt. I decided to piece together three different patterns to get the look I wanted. First, the bodice is from McCall's pattern number 4948. I've used it before in my Alice in Wonderland dress and I like how it fits. The skirt pattern I drafted myself over top the petticoat. It's designed in multiple panels to match the seams and darts of the bodice. Last, the sleeve pattern is Simplicity 1045. I altered that pattern by shortening the sleeves about seven inches total for the sequin fabric and added a three inch wide trim. I wanted it to hit at my wrist when finished in order to still see her gloves. However, if you want a simpler look, but do not want to alter or put together any patterns, I would work off of Simplicity 1045. With the design planned out, I then sourced my fabric, which was great, until I changed the sequin fabric last minute. So let's talk about the materials and why this change derailed the project for eight months. Let's talk about that sequin fabric. I originally purchased this sequin fabric because at the time I was sourcing my materials, it was the best color match in a sequin I could find. I thought it would look good with a purple lining underneath it. 
But then I was walking around Joann's and I found this. It was stunning, a heavy duty sequin, similar in shape, color, and iridescence to my source material, and I thought long and hard in the store about pivoting. I ultimately purchased all the new sequin fabric in stock and then had to go to another Joann's location and buy all of their stock too. So any ideas of what to do with this extra purple fabric or if I just sell it, let me know in the comments. While these are both sequin fabrics, there are significant differences between these two, but it comes down to a few points. The one I used has a nap or a direction to the fabric, so I had to cut all the pieces out in the same direction, which can lead to more waste and material cost. For a large sequin like this, it's typically not recommended that you have any darts or gathers and ideally a smaller number of seams. And as we just discussed in my designs, I have a lot of darts and seams. For a tight fit, such as at the bodice or the arm's eye, it's recommended to remove the sequins from the seam allowance prior to sewing, first hand stitching, then by machine. Last, broken needles. Just, it's gonna happen a lot. So if you don't wanna deal with all that, I'd go with an easier fabric to work with, such as this one. For everyone else, buckle up. I will put a list of materials below, none of which are sponsored. For this tutorial, you will need Black lining fabric, I use a black cotton. Gold fabric for the sleeve trim, I used a gold satin. Red lining for the sleeves, I used a red satin. A zipper, small snips that are not your thread snips. Thread, pinking shears, chain needles, elastic, and sequin fabric. I pre-washed all the fabric to prep and ironed everything except for the sequin fabric. The lining of the dress is cut out in the black cotton and the sleeves in the red satin. The gold trim at the sleeves I cut out in a seven inch width on the bias. They will be folded in half and include a half inch seam allowance to give us our three inch trim. I wanted the sequins to be all in the downward direction on each piece. I recommend following the sequin line downwards along the grain line to try and make sure you are square when cutting out your pattern pieces. Cut out the sequins with regular non-fabric scissors that you don't mind getting dulled. The fabric can wiggle on you as you do this. Keeping the fabric taut helps. And just know sequins will fly everywhere and get everywhere and just follow you around. Once everything is cut out, you can prep the sequin pieces. To help with the fit, I removed the sequins from all of the bodice seams and darts at the arm's eye and top of sleeve, and at the waist. I did this to help with the close fit, but other seams that were a bit more flowy, I found it was okay not removing the sequins. However, they can get stuck in the seams that way. They can also be sharp and damage other fabrics, which is why a lining is important. First, I'll show you the method I used on a scrap piece of fabric. I added a stay stitch line and a contrasting color at each seam. When you can, try to feed the sequin fabric through the machine in the direction of the sequins to avoid getting stuck in the machine or on the dog feeds. If you can't sew in the direction of the sequins, go slowly and manually push the sequins out of the way and free any sequins that get stuck in the feet as needed. I then used fray block to make sure the fabric wouldn't fray as I was working with it to remove the sequins. Place a rag or towel under the fabric to protect your table from any running color. Once dry, take small snips that are not your thread snips and clip the sequin itself to remove. You can try to snip the thread holding the row of sequins on the fabric, but I was worried about the fabric integrity, so I snipped the plastic of each sequin at the top and pulled it off. I do not recommend cutting any sequins partially. The sharp edge can damage your dress or lining. Now you can listen to a podcast, watch your favorite Disney movies, or all 15 seasons of Criminal Minds because all of the clipping is repetitive and part of the reason it took so long. I removed the sequins also from the center back and the back of the skirt where the zipper will be placed. I removed some extra around the zipper to make sure it wouldn't get caught since I know the cape will cover it. Last, Search the raw edges. For the edges that have sequins in them, I ran them through my machine slowly and used chain needles in my machine. With all the pieces ready, we can finally put this together. 
The second reason that the sequin fabric can take some time is hand stitching. I find hand stitching to be extremely helpful to make sure you don't trap any sequin from the seam. It also helps to make sure they don't push the fabric around while you're trying to sew. As a note, all steps outlined here will be done for the lining, but you do not need to hand stitch the lining in each step. For the lining steps only, you'll need to iron the seams. Starting with the bodice, I hand stitch the darts on both the front and back before machine stitching. Then stitch the side seams and shoulder seams together. Then I stitch together the skirt panels. Since I left the sequins in the seam allowance, I carefully machine stitched with a G needle. Going slowly will help reduce the risk of a needle breaking. Attach the bodice at the waist by hand and then machine stitch. Then attach the zipper to the outer dress only. In some cases, it can be hard to hand stitch or machine stitch with the sequins. I found flipping the sequins and taping them down with scotch tape kept them out of the way without damaging them. Next, I stitched together the sleeves of the side seams. Measure the length of the sleeve and make the gold trim that length. I found it easier to iron in half. Stitch the two sides together in the seam allowance before stitching to the sleeve. In this step, I used the tape to help move the sequins out of the way and did not need to hand stitch this step. In the reference photos, I found she has an elastic band to make sure the outer sleeve doesn't move too far up her arms when she raises them. So I added a loop about two to three inches on each side of the upper sleeve seam. I then added a gathering line at the cap of the sleeve and left a long tail. Gathering lines are not recommended for sequins and you can alter the sleeve to better fit within the arm size since it is from two different patterns. But I knew the cape would lay over the top anyways, so I did a bit of gathering. Gather the top of the sleeve and pin in place. Hand stitch the sleeve into the bodice first before machine stitching. To attach the lining to the dress, first attach at the neckline. From there, to help it lay flat, trim the seam allowance with pinking shears and clip into the seam allowance as needed. I then hand stitch the lining to the bodice at the zipper. Last, I hand stitched the sleeve lining to the sleeves, tucking in the seam allowance. As an additional detail, I added this gold and red curtain tassel as her belt. But let's get started on the Evil Queen collar. The collar from the show is similar to the movie with multiple points and sides. It looks like it ends around eye height, around to the back of the crown, and tucks under the dress and cape. I was also very aware that cons are different from a show where she never comes in contact with people, therefore I wanted to make it a bit more structural. 
it would need to survive both the packing in a suitcase and getting jostled in a crowded convention floor. That being said, for the structure, I went with 1mm EVA foam, flexible boning, 12 gauge aluminum wire, and grill grain ribbon for the wire casing. For the fabric, I used a white textured satin, black cotton lining, the same I used in the dress, and fusible interfacing. Right now, the plan is to attach it to the dress with snaps, but all the finishing details will be in their own video as I navigate towards the end how it will all come together. So the interfacing will help stabilize everything. With all the materials, I started to draft the pattern. I first started with the bodice pattern and some craft paper. I traced the collar of the pattern for the front and the back bodice pieces, lining up at the shoulder. I made a half pattern ending around 1.5 inches from center front. I estimated the shape I wanted before tracing it onto some muslin and adding some EVA foam to understand the shape. I learned a few things from this pattern. It looked like one of those giant lizards with the collar. What are those things called? Frilled lizards? So I both trimmed down the height and made the top a uniform, slightly curved shape with my hip curve. Second is there was too much volume. It looked more like a flat collar than a standing collar and it was really big. So I pinched out some of the material and altered the pattern by slashing and pivoting to make a new one. Once I thought I had something that would work, I cut it out of the EVA foam. From there, I started to stitch the boning to the EVA foam. I was really nervous about putting this through my machine, but it worked amazingly, and the curved boning really helped create the shape. After that, I added the wire channel to the top by flat stitching in the grow grain. Then I tucked one end under and stitched it down. Then I added the wire, making sure to bend the ends so it wouldn't burst through the case. Then I tucked in the second side and stitched it close. The sides I ended up wrapping around the front edges and stitching down. This worked better than expected, and you could also do this for the top for more control of the movement of the collar. With the interior complete, I moved to the satin cover. I started by tracing the structure of the collar as a first draft pattern and stitched it together. I also traced the bodice pattern again and created a base for the collar to sit on about four inches wide. I did a second pattern that had multiple pieces in order to reduce the volume in the middle. Sewing it together and seeing how it fit, I realized that it was bubbling quite a bit compared to the side that was more fitted. I ultimately decided that I did not mind the multiple panels because I preferred the closer fit to the interior structure. I used the same pattern for both sides of the collar. I cut out the pieces in the white satin and the lowest part of the collar in the black cotton, as well as the interfacing. Next, I overlocked all the pieces. Then I stitched together all the panels and attached the standing collar at the side seams. Next, I ironed flat all the seams Next, I stitched the side seams of the lower collar together. I then ironed on the interfacing because I forgot to do that before I stitched it together. In order to put it all together, I started with the collar facing right side up. I placed the standing collar on top and sandwiched it into the rest of the lower collar. Then I stitched through all the layers of the neckline.
Next, I wrestled the collar into the sleeve and checked to make sure I was happy with it. Last, I hand stitched the collar closed at the top. And now, here's the final result. I'm fairly impressed with myself on this one. I think after how long the sequin dress took and how many mock-ups I did of the hood, I was fearful it would take a long time, but it only took four days. And I was not consistently working on it in that time frame. It's not perfect, and I think I would change a few things around how the collar sits and see if I can make the pattern into one solid fabric piece like the parts do, but overall I'm really happy with it. The last piece of the costume is the cape. This was fun to make because it adds a lot of impact without being quite as challenging as the other pieces of the costume. I'm also obsessed with the fabric, and I think it adds a lot of drama to the overall look. The design of the cape in the Villains World show is a beautiful floral design on a black fabric with a red lining. The cape in the show is also a smaller footprint and more manageable than the cape in the movie which is good news for us because it means less pattern matching. For those of you who haven't done it, pattern matching is when there is a pattern on a fabric and each piece of the fabric lines up and looks as if it is one continuous pattern. Determining if you'll pattern match or not in the design phase is important because it will dictate how much fabric you need to purchase. For example, this pattern has a vertical pattern repeat of 19.2 inches and I had to factor that into how many yards of fabric I needed. I couldn't find an exact match for the show fabric, but I found a beautiful velvet fabric with gold foil flowers, so we'll use this as our fashion fabric. I used a red satin for the lining, the same non-shiny side I used for the sleeves, interfacing, and thread. With our materials collected and overall design, I moved on to drafting the pattern. When drafting the pattern, I wanted to minimize the amount of seams to avoid pattern matching. I originally drafted the cape in two pieces, but found the fabric was sitting oddly at the shoulders, which I did not like. As I draped, I looked back at the reference pictures and saw there was a seam towards the front here that I hadn't previously noticed. It's a bit challenging when the image quality varies between my references. This seam allows the fabric to better flow over the shoulders, and I followed where to place that seam based on how the fabric wanted to sit. I then traced it onto craft paper, trued up the pattern, and had the completed half pattern. If you do not want to draft your own pattern, store-bought is fine. I've never used the patterns personally, but I think Simplicity 8721 or 5794 would be good options. Here's what my pattern ended up looking like. It has two back pieces to be stitched together at center back, and the two front pieces stitched to add the clasp at the front to better fit around the shoulders. I first cut out the lining in the red satin and overlocked all the pieces. I then cut out the interfacing. I then ironed the seams flat on the lining before ironing that interfacing on, which I did after overlocking and stitching it together again because I keep forgetting about it, but you could also put on the interfacing before stitching on the front pieces. For the velvet fabric, I first planned out where I wanted the pattern to be on the cape. This step is important because it can be odd or awkward if the pattern is in a weird spot. I wanted the large flowers to start around these shoulder blades to not get cut off at the top. Once I liked how the flowers were positioned, I cut out one side of the cape first. Another difference in cutting out a large pattern fabric like this is that I cut right side up in order to see the pattern. I usually cut my fabric with the right side down to avoid any pencil markings on the outside of the fabric. With the first side cut out, I then found where it matched on the fabric to make a continuous pattern. When you find where to line it up, make sure there is plenty of space for the second side to be cut out on the fabric. I then carefully pinned on the cut out fabric piece using plenty of pins to line up each foil spot. 
Next, my pattern piece included seam allowance, so I had to factor that into how the second was going to be cut out. My seam allowance was a quarter of an inch at center back. So to account for that seam allowance, I had to move my pattern piece twice that, 1.5 inches total. This will make sure that when we stitch together, the patterns line up on the seam rather than at the edge of the fabric. Once the second pattern piece is pinned on the fabric, you can then remove the first piece in order to cut. With the pieces cut out, I then overlock the fashion fabric before carefully pinning. My strategy for pinning was to perpendicular pin at the foil flowers. Then I parallel pinned further into the piece to reduce the fabric's ability to shift while I sewed. I machine stitched the center back slowly and then the shoulder seams for the velvet and the lining. Since the fabric had some stretch, I had to be careful here. I don't think I've been that nervous or slow at sewing a straight line since I started sewing. Mine isn't perfect, but it's pretty close. If you want to have a bit more control, you can hand stitch first. Then match up the lining to the fashion fabric, right sides together, and stitch together at each side, then the straps and neckline. Next, I cut off the corner seam allowance to reduce bulk and clipped into the neckline seam allowance curve to have everything lay flat when it was turned right side out. Last, you may have noticed that I have not completed the brooch clasp at the front of her cape. I am finalizing how I want that to look, so that will be completed in a future final details video. With it right side out, I placed it onto a dress form and admired it. And I'll keep admiring it for the next week. It's placed there for the fabric to sit the same way it'll be worn. The fabric needs to stretch now before it's hemmed. If it stretches after you hem, you'll see the rolling like we had with the Sylvie cape because the lining stretched less than the outside fabric. I've seen folks recommend anywhere from 24 hours to two weeks of settling before hemming. We are so, so close to the end of making the Evil Queen. We have just four things to finish and then she'll be complete. Hemming the dress and cape, attaching the hood to the shirt, fasteners for the collar, fasteners for the cape, and the brooch. So let's get started. To finish the cosplay, you'll need the following materials. A Dritz hem chalk marker, eight size four snaps, two hooks and bars, safety pins, a brooch, and a crown. Before I started hemming, I first had to decide on my heel height and how long I wanted the dress. I wanted it to be just brushing the ground so I wouldn't have to worry about tripping or people stepping on the cape or dress at a con. I started with the petticoat. After the petticoat sat on the dress form over time, the fabric had stretched and become uneven. I first did the base layer and then the bottom tier of the petticoat. I used a hem chalk powder marker to mark all the way around the dress. I tried to let the layers sit as naturally as possible as I went around. The chalk marker I used can't measure floor length dresses, so I measured four inches above the ground and used that as a baseline. From there, I measured down how many inches I wanted remaining with seam allowance. I cut off the excess and hemmed by doing a quarter inch turned hem. I then did the same thing with the second tier by chalking the hem, marking down, ironing, cutting, 
before serging and finishing the hem. After the dress had also sat on the dress form for two weeks, I started hemming the lining with a chalk marker, measured down, accounting for seam allowance, and removed the excess, but I did not hem the lining yet. Repeat the same process with the sequin outer dress. I then went to overlock the sequin fabric using my great safety goggles and pretty much immediately broke a needle. I then decided to zigzag to help prevent fraying instead. Once both the lining and the sequin dress are ready, I hand stitch them together. If for some unknown reason you are like me and decide to hand stitch this on the cold tile bathroom floor, I recommend sitting on a pillow. Then use the same process to hem the cape. With the hemming complete, I moved on to the hood. I started by putting on the hood and the base shirt and safety pinning the hood all the way around the shirt. Try to keep your head neutral as you pin to have the fabric fall naturally. You may need an extra set of hands to help pin and I recommend using safety pins instead of sewing pins so you can safely remove the garments after the pinning. I then moved my head all the way around to make sure I had full range of mobility. Once it's pinned in place and I was happy with the fit, I carefully removed it and used sewing pins to pin it into place. Then you can zigzag stitch it together. The zigzag stitch will help the fabric maintain its stretchiness. I also left the area around the zipper open by about an inch on each side, just to make sure I could zip it on and off easily. I decided to fasten the collar to the hood rather than the dress to have an easier time taking it on and off. I first put on the base shirt and pinned where the collar needed to be attached at the front and back. One snap on each side of the front and one snap on each side of the back. I tried on the dress as well to make sure they were pinned in the correct spots. Once you have your markings, I used another set of safety pins to match each garment's marking and hand stitch the snaps into place. I put the male snaps on the collar and the female snaps on the shirt to allow it to snap down into place for better leverage. In the areas that the snaps were sewn through both the shirt and the hood, I did not feel the need to reinforce them, but for the snaps that were only sewn to the velvet, I added an interfacing or stabilizer. The collar already had interfacing and did not need additional reinforcement. I then put everything back on and tested the placements of the snaps. Happy with the fit, I next put on the cape and marked where I wanted the fasteners to go. I used two snaps at the center front, a snap on each shoulder, and two hooks and bars in the back to help keep the cape in place. Once everything was marked, I carefully removed the garments and hand stitched each fastener into place. I ultimately decided not to make the brooch and crown for a variety of reasons. The brooch I didn't really love the style of in the show and so I went with a brooch off of Amazon and the crown I wasn't sure how I wanted to actually make it so I ended up purchasing it from an Etsy seller who was awesome. I'll link them both down in the description below. The only kind of bummer was the crown does show a lot of fingerprints but I was warned of that before I purchased it and all subsequent fingerprints are entirely my own fault. And with the last stitch in place, the Evil Queen is finally done. Eight months of work and hundreds of hours come to a close. Here's the reveal. This was by far the most ambitious and best project I've ever made. I'm thrilled with how she turned out. 
I was very detail oriented and took my time compared to most of my projects and she was definitely worth the effort. Thank you so much for going on this journey with me. If you enjoyed it or learned something new, don't forget to subscribe. My goal is to the thousand and I'm thrilled to have you all here. I'll see you next time.